Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Pateman, and I am the director of the Turks and Caicos National Museum, both here in Provo and in Grand Turk. I have the pleasure of welcoming you all here this evening, introducing our guest speaker, and also the baggage for money part also, because we are a nonprofit, and so we're always asking for donations and so forth, but I won't do that just yet. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Bill Keegan from the University of Florida, the Florida Museum of Natural History. Bill has been doing archaeology in the Turks and Caicos and the Bahama Archipelago for 40 years, you've said now? Longer than I've been alive, so... Um, I remind you of that all the time. That <laughs> the year he started his work here in the Turks and Caicos was the year I was born. He came in January, I was born in July. So he's been coming to these islands longer than I've been alive. Um, Bill and I have been working really closely together the last four years on projects, mainly in the Bahamas, but also trying to get him to come here also. So just an example, we just did a project, actually just yesterday, we had a project where we recovered this ceramic vessel from here in the Caicos Islands. Wow. Um, we're not going to disclose the location just because oh, yeah. um, we want to be a little hesitant. We don't want the site trampled and so mm -hmm. forth. But this is a ceramic vessel, and I'm not sure if you're going to talk about it. How big is it? Oh, it's a very small, about, I think, 20 centimeters. So the credit card, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry? The, the credit card, card in front of it. So oh, that's, card. that's just a scale. Is it credit card size? Yeah, about credit card okay. size. Thank you. So um, this is a vessel that was underwater, and we've recovered it, and it's actually being conserved here in the museum, and unfortunately we can't bring it out right now. But we hope that this is one of the feature exhibits when we build our new museum here in Grace Bay. And for those of you who not, have not seen the design, on the welcome panel behind you, there is a design. It's about a 5,000 square foot facility that we're going to be building right here on the land. We're still in the process of fundraising for it, so this is now my plea for money. It's uh, about $2.2 .2 million that we're raising. Um, every donation helps. We have memberships. Uh, we have donations. We're going to have a fundraising gala later this year. This will be the second annual one. So if you're interested in learning more about these things, please sign up for membership because we send out a monthly newsletter and we won't overwhelm you with spam. Because I know I personally don't like receiving a lot of emails from organizations. So we kind of keep it low. So we'll, when we have more of these events, you'll be notified and, and so forth. Um, now, oh, and also I want to acknowledge our board member Mark Parrish and Kim Mortimore. They were the ones who made us aware of this discovery and oh. got the funds together for this vessel to be recovered and conserved and to allow us to build a display case. Also, and Mark took this wonderful photo when we recovered it. And then also in the back, we have Dr. Lindsay Block. She's from the Florida Museum also. And she, she's a ceramic specialist. And so we had to have her so she could tell us what it is. What it is, because <laughs> Bill and I, we act like we know everything, but we don't. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, without further ado, so you can stop hearing me talk. I'd like to let Bill take the floor. Thanks, Mike. It is a real pleasure. This um, month is actually the 42nd anniversary of my first trip to Turks and Caicos. Um, and uh, Chuck Hess, some of you know, made it possible through the Pride Foundation on Pine Key. And I barely arrived here, and he put me on a plane to Middle Caicos, where I hooked up with Dr. Sean Sullivan and spent a fabulous week. So I owe a lot to, uh, to Chuck and to uh, um, Sean for uh, really getting my career started. I've got some introductory comments because things can get random quickly, so I've written some things down so that I give them in an order that hopefully will be understanding, um, understandable. Um, so my focus is going to be on the Bahamas Archipelago, which includes both Turks and Caicos and um, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. The Spanish called these Las Islas de los Lucayos, 
Um, so we uh, today call the original native inhabitants Lucayans, so just an English version of Lucayos. Um, their territory encompasses more than 700 islands, keys, and islets with a land area of almost 14,000 square kilometers extending from South Florida to Hispaniola, over 1,000 kilometers, and spread over 470,000 square kilometers of tropical North Atlantic Ocean. So a huge area um, that, uh, that they were spread across. Um, the Bahamas, as most of you know, or all of you probably, do not touch the Caribbean Sea. And I include this for <laughs> but we have the most but beautiful beach you in have the, the most beautiful beaches in the Caribbean. Caribbean. Absolutely. <laughs> but uh, cruise ship and tourist operations are always talking about yeah. this being in the Cari Caribbean. <laughs> but the Lucayans are culturally affiliated with the pre-Columbian Caribbean societies. In fact, our portrait of Lucayan lifeways has been drawn largely through reference to the historic descriptions and interpretations of cultural practices for the Greater Antilles. Um, sometimes called Arawak, sometimes called Tainos. Um, the names uh, tend to get uh, more in the way than, um, than be helpful. Efforts over the past century um, <coughs> have attempted to identify contacts with Florida, and we just did a National Geographic funded project on uh, Great Abaco in May. Um, our timing couldn't have been better because we couldn't do it uh, yeah. after that. Um, but uh, we failed to find um, any real concrete evidence. To a large degree, the Bahamas have been marginalized by the Caribbean archaeological community, the Lucayan Islands. Walkover surveys have been conducted on most of the larger and inhabited islands, but very few excavations. They've been limited primarily to San Salvador um, and Turks and Caicos. Um, and then more recently, the work Mike and I have been doing on Long Island. So part of what's, uh, what's come about is the people working in the Bahamas argue that the Lucayans came from Cuba, and the people working in Turks and Caicos argue that the Lucayans came from Hispaniola. So I'm going to start by talking about some recent research we've done to clarify um, that question, or actually we've answered that question. I think. <laughs> um, and uh, that has to do with the name Carib in my title. Then I'm going to talk about the research we've been doing in Long Island. Um, and. Uh, the main point of that is that I want to make clear that the Lucayans were a unique cultural expression. They're not just Arawaks, they're not just some flavor of Tainos. And the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that just like today, the people on different islands were different. They weren't all exactly the same. And so we tend to talk about Arawaks as if all Arawaks were alike, or Lucayans as if all of them were alike. Um, the situation that we have is we're dealing with very limited information, and we get different information from working in different places. And so there's a tendency to take unique characteristics, unique features like the sites we have on Grand Turk, and then generalize them to the rest of the area. And so some of what I'm going to say today works um, that way, but I also want you to keep in mind that, uh, that Lucayans, like the people today, um, there's different expressions of them throughout the islands. Um, for instance, we just found, a, um, uh, identified a new type of pottery in Abaco that had previously unrecognized associated with the Lucayans. So um, new things are happening all the time. Although Caribbean uh, migrations are far more complicated, uh, you all know where you are, right? <laughs> so here's Long Island for those of you who don't know the Bahamas. And then our work was done up here in Abaco in May. There we go. So although Caribbean migrations are far more, com far more complicated, two ep episodes of population expansion um, have received the most attention. The first is an archaic migration, which happened about four to 5,000 years ago, which comes from this area, um, as far as we know, goes into Cuba and then spreads through Hispaniola and into Puerto Rico, and we've argued recently that they came down into these northern islands as well. The second one, which um, people are most familiar with, is a movement out of, uh, of uh, eastern Venezuela. Um, and you'll read that they came up through the Lesser Antilles and into Puerto Rico, 
but the evidence we're seeing suggests that they actually made a direct jump across the Caribbean Sea to Puerto Rico and the Northern Islands about 800 BC, and then the same people who had spread down the Orinoco River, uh, or the same group of people, uh, the same culture that we, or the way we identify it, um, about um, almost a thousand years later began the second movement up through this chain of islands, and. No one has looked at it yet. It's something we've identified very recently, but I'm really excited to try and look at what happens when two peoples who are um, from the same you know, ancestral stock meet after a thousand years of, of being apart. Um, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Now, it has long been assumed that our islands, the Lucayan Islands, were colonized at the end of this migration that came through, um, came up through, um, through Puerto Rico, and then eventually into Hispaniola and Cuba and the Bahamas. But um, we're seeing that, uh, that the situation is actually uh, more complicated, and um, we're going to uh, um, talk about a, a new migration today. So. The Saladoid peoples, the early Arawaks that I'm talking about in the time period between 800 BC and about 400 AD, um, are South American Arawaks, and they lived in circular villages like this one. This is a Quicuru village, a uh, modern village in, uh, in Brazil. Um, they were settled agriculturalists. They had a, um, a hierarchy in their social organization so that they were chiefs. And, um, it's been projected that the Lucayans practiced, had a similar way of life and um, similar social organization, but we don't see anything on this scale. And this is a relatively, what you would consider a relatively simple group. I mean, these houses are at least 50 feet long, sometimes as long as 100 feet long. And there is nowhere anywhere in the Lucayan Islands that we see settlements on this scale. Now, we do see them in, um, in Dominican Republic, we see them in Haiti, um, we see them in Puerto Rico, but not on these smaller islands. So there's already one major significant difference is that people here weren't living in these very, very large villages. In fact, the Lucayan lifeways that we're recreating look much more like those earlier archaic age practices, the people um, who came into, um, originally into Cuba around, uh, 4,000 years ago than they do the Arawaks who are to the south. Um, that's one of the reasons that Cuba was suggested as the place that the Lucayans came from. So a recent study that we've done is um, with some um, human remains. We have a whole variety of studies going on. We have radiocarbon dating um, of uh, 60 Lucayan skeletons from around the Bahamas. We did, um, uh, we have DNA analysis on 25? 30. On 30. Um, so we're going to be able to look at their genetic heritage. And this is a study that I did with Ann Ross, um, who's a professor, a forensic anthropologist at North Carolina State University, and uh, Colleen Young, who's a graduate student at the University of Missouri, in which we were looking at um, the facial characteristics. And um, everybody has facial characteristics that have a genetic basis to them. And so we see that people in different places or from different places look different from each other. It's what I have been sort of jokingly calling facial profiling. And so we did this study looking at um, the facial characteristics of, we only had eight individuals that we could look at. Um, but the facial characteristics that we saw, they were digitized, and there's very specific points on the skull that people measure. And we found that the people from the Bahamas, and we don't have any Turks and Caicos yet, but we have a potential, if uh, anyone is interested in adding Turks and Caicos to this. Um, we found that the facial characteristics of the people from the Bahamas clustered with those from Hispaniola and Jamaica. The Arawak migration I talked about the uh, skulls from Puerto Rico cluster, as we would expect, with Colombia and Venezuela. And the earlier migration um, from the Yucatan area into Cuba 
cluster as well. So we have three distinct clusters of facial characteristics in the islands. So this, to us, says that the people who lived in the Bahama Islands came through the Turks and Caicos. The um, earliest known site is the Coralie site uh, near North Creek in Grand Turk. It dates to about, um, the earliest part is about 700 AD. Um, there's nothing close to that early. There's some early dates, but they're not um, necessarily reliable, but there's nothing anywhere near that early. We're seeing in the Bahamas that we don't see um, a large population until after 1000 AD. So they were here in Turks and Caicos much earlier than they were in the rest of the Bahamas. Um, that site is, is fascinating um, because we see animals, we're, we're seeing on Grand Turk what happens when people first reach an island. So they're harvesting um, full adult sea turtles weighing um, 600 to 800 pounds. They're, um, they're capturing iguanas that are twice as large as the largest iguanas that we see today. Um, and they um, were eating a tortoise. So imagine being on Grand Turk with all the wonderful donkeys and horses and having a tortoise the size of a Galapagos tortoise about this big <laughs> walking around on the island yeah, as well. I forgot the donkeys. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was the first discovery of tortoises was made here in Turks and Caicos. And now the paleontologists have been looking at caves elsewhere, and we're finding that every bank in the Bahamas, the Caicos Bank, um, the Great Bahama Bank, the Little Bahama Bank, the one at Crooked Island, they all have their own different distinct tortoise on them. But none of that would have happened if not for the research done here in Turks and Caicos. All those tortoises are extinct now. Yes, all those tortoises are extinct. So we have our characteristics, and then you can see these clusters again, Bahamas, Hispaniola, Jamaica, Panama and Florida don't connect with any of this, um, Yucatan and Cuba, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, and Colombia is a bit of an outlier, which actually makes sense because what we're arguing is that uh, this migration represents the arrival of Caribs in the northern Bahamas, in Hispaniola, well in Hispaniola, and uh, by 800 AD, so about the time that people are first moving into the Bahamas or into the Lucayan Islands, um, we see Caribs arriving in Hispaniola. And I spent 30 years saying that Columbus was wrong about saying there were Caribs up here. Um, and uh, I'll be the first to admit that uh, Columbus was right and I was wrong. <laughs> So again, here's these migrations we I talked about, the early Arawak migration coming up into Puerto Rico, the earlier archaic migration coming into Cuba, and what we're seeing and what we're arguing for is a Carib migration that began around um, just before, sometime before 800 AD. Can I make sure. a, a question here? They, they've been passing through quite a lot of, of ocean to get from Venezuela to, to Hispaniola. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, you know, and we know that they had can canoes, mm -hmm. but uh, that's a long distance to travel. They, 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 that's not done in a night or two. two days. It's about six to seven days. So, so, and they didn't know where it was, where they were going. Well, one of the things that one of the ways that people have talked about migrations is if they go in one direction, yeah. and the people go and never come back. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is movement back and forth between these areas. And so knowledge of what was out there was probably fairly general. And one of the surprising things is when we start looking at some of the artifacts that we can identify as coming from another place, is there's a strong connection, even at 800 BC, between Colombia and Puerto Rico. So there's probably some sort of general knowledge, at least in some of these areas, that there's islands out there and that they can be reached. And seven days in a canoe um, is really not, um, <laughs> not such a big deal for people who are, are living on the ocean and used to the ocean. And I like to point out to people that, uh, that the Polynesians were sailing um, 
almost 2,000 miles into open ocean without any knowledge that there was anything, to, uh, anything there. The same with Columbus. He headed out there. There was general knowledge that there was something else. But he had a big boat. Yeah. <laughs> Not a canoe. He did have a big boat and he had a year's supply of food. So. But he made the mistake that the Polynesians didn't make. He sailed with the wind. The, the, the Polynesians were smart enough that they sailed into the wind so, they so that if they didn't, didn't find anything, they could turn around and come back easily. So, but Columbus, I'll, I'll give him um, great credit for recognizing the circulation of winds in the Northern Hemisphere. And um, that was the secret that he had that uh, no one else seemed to, that he could sail um, towards the south with the... Uh, with the westerlies and then come north and come back on the easterlies. And so he actually did have, uh, have information that he, um, he was able to use. So I'm not going to talk about styles too much, but basically the, um, the pottery has been put into this um, singular sequence of saladoid, to ostinoid, to maicoid, to chicoid. And we pulled out some sherds that were um, generously donated to the museum. Um, uh, they're all in, um, mostly all in the Mayakoid style, which is the style I'm going to talk about. Um, we now know, or now think, that Ostinoid is pottery that was actually being made by the Archaics. Again, one of the other problems that we have in conceptualizing this is that things get frozen in time. And so you think that people who started as, um, as moving widely through the environment, not necessarily forming um, long-term communities, stayed that way for 4,000 years, and that's just not, not likely. So um, we thought that, um, that the archaic people never had pottery because the early sites don't, but we know now that uh, later in time they did adopt pottery, and um, I've argued that the osteonoid style is actually archaic age pottery. Um, the Mayakoid style, I'm going to suggest, is, um, is actually carob pottery. And this Chicoid style is something that did develop out of the earlier Saladoid, but it's restricted to um, mostly the Eastern Dominican Republic and then into, um, into Haiti a little bit. So, I'm lost already. Anyway, these are the, the differences in the styles. Um, it was suggested that Ostinoid came out of Saladoid and then be turned into Mayakoid and then turned into Chicoid. But if you can see enough similarities between them to make that connection, um, then you're doing a lot better than I am because they're very different styles. And um, we know that people will use pottery as an expression of identity. And so what I'm seeing here is at least three expressions of identity. The um, question. Yes. Um, you said you found um, the pottery in the Lucan Islands, mm -hmm. but then most, most of these islands are made out of limestone, so where would have you gotten the clay from? Okay, so I'm talking about um, Greater Antillean styles at this point, and um, we'll get to Palmetto Ware and the local clays shortly. Okay. But you're right, these are not um, styles that were made here in the Lucayan Islands. They're found here through trade, but they were never... Um, they were never made here, although there are some copies of the styles in the, um, the local pottery. So, as I said, Mayakoid pottery... Let me get rid of these. Hold your breath. There you are. Um, Mayakoid pottery was associated with um, developing out of that simple redware osteonoid. But if you look to South America, you see that, um, that that style, that very fine line, oblique parallel line incisions, little triangles, punctations, um, this is actually pottery from the Northwest Amazon. And it looks, you can compare these photographs with what you can see on the table, and um, very similar, including these sort of funny-faced adornos as well. And this style actually begins in Ecuador at a much earlier date. This is something called Valdivia pottery. And again, I put Valdivia pottery next to um, some of the Mayakoid in our collection to show you some of the similarities. Um, and um, the, the book, uh, the Megger's book, has about 20 plates of, photo of um, 
of different um, pottery sherds, and you can see um, almost on every page something that looks very close to Mayakoit. So what we're arguing is that, that the style that developed in, um, in Ecuador, or is first identified in Ecuador, and we know that it spread eastward into, um, into Colombia, and um, then we believe spread with Carib um, into um, the Greater Antilles. Mm -hmm. And the Chicoy style has much, um, as we saw, a much broader line incision, a line and dot pattern. And these are things that continue into, um, um, continue from the earlier Arawak saladoid style. So we're looking at two, I think, very distinct groups. And actually, Lindsay, there's the hands to the mouth. So I had forgotten about that one. OK, palmetto ware. Um, you're more than welcome to come up and look at these and handle them. And we brought a piece of palmetto ware to show you. Palmetto ware is made from, um, there are red clays here on the island and throughout the Bahamas. Um, one of the, um, the things that Lindsay's been working on with us is um, trying to better understand how this pottery was made and what its constituents are. Um, so we've been collecting, she's been collecting clay samples. We have samples from Abaco and Long Island and, and here on Provo now. And um, burned and crushed conch shell. And we know that it's burned and crushed conch shell because if you take raw shell and put it into a, a paste like this, when it's heated, it expands and explodes. So you have to burn the shell first to convert it to a, a different um, a different structure before you can use it in the, um, as a tempering agent. And the red clay you speak of, is, would that have anything to do with the red dust that comes here from Africa? That might yes, be, yeah. it starts out as, as African red dust. So this pottery is, even though it's locally made, is <laughs> really important. And in fact, in fact, one of my colleagues was looking at it um, and identified tektites, which are micrometeorites. So this, this pottery comes from space. From space, essentially, yeah. So it's, um, it's the only pottery that was made locally. And we can really distinguish this pottery, which we call imported, um, because it has volcanic tempers in it. And as you know, there's nothing volcanic here in, um, in the Lucayan Islands. And some of the decorations that have been identified um, these, the, you can see Bayakoy designs have been incorporated into some palmetto wear shirts, although most of the palmetto wear we find is not decorated. So that palmetto wear would be from the Bahamian archipelago? Yes, this piece here is from um, the Clifton Heritage Park on um, New Providence, if you've um, been there. It's um, actually the, the Flipper site, which is um, where they filmed the TV show Flipper, or one of the movies or something. The TV show. The TV show Flipper. So, and it comes right, right from next to the dock that they filmed. <laughs> um, so, we were talking about canoes a little bit uh, earlier, and Columbus, you know, a, um, a seasoned sailor himself, was extremely impressed by the canoes. Um, he saw them that could hold up to 100 men on, in some places, he said. And uh, they could be paddled at almost six knots, which was as fast as his caravels could sail. And he said that if, uh, if they happened to be capsized by a wave, they jumped out, bailed the water out with a calabash, and um, jumped back in and just kept going as if nothing had happened. <laughs> so they were, um, seafarers. they were seafarers, and people who live along the sea um, are often much more adept at it than those of us who don't spend much time on the water. I mentioned some early sites, so Grand Turk is the oldest. There are sites also in San Salvador, New Providence, and the north end of Eleuthera that have um, suggestive early dates, but um, um, the context in which they were found is not great. So um, you can date any material, but you have to be able to show that it's associated with an activity. And, um, we're not always able to do that well. Um, I just had some things dated from um, Abaco because we didn't have anything adequate. And it's from a site that's completely scattered. So I can't say for sure that the charcoal that I dated is, um, is associated with the artifacts that I found. We can't date pottery. So we have to do things like charcoal and bone. Um, 
But I got the radiocarbon dates I like, so I'm <laughs> going to use them. Um, one of the, uh, as I was saying, there's, we find different things in different places. And one of the things that, uh, that uh, made our, um, our facial profiling possible was three on, uh, on Long Island. And they're very unusual because they're, they're the first sand dune burials to be excavated anywhere in the Lucayan Islands uh, professionally. There are reports of, of bones washing out of beach dunes and things, but um, sometimes um, the person who found it doesn't want you to know where it was, and um, other times um, they're just destroyed by, um, um, by the storms. But uh, Mike and I um, excavated these. They're very unusual. Um, and um, since most of the other human remains that have been recovered are from caves where they've been sort of jumbled up, this is sort of our first look at, at burial practices. And this is an adult male who was buried upside down with his hands tied above his head. Hmm. And the bones from the waist down are missing. Hmm. So I was telling Mike the other day, I think that the Caribs cut his legs off and cooked them on a fire, <laughs> but he won't. I accept that one yet, but, but yeah, it's very strange. This individual is missing the bones from the waist down. Um, and and uh, if anybody can explain why you would bury someone face down with their hands really on top of their skull, you can see one of the, one of the arms right here coming up. The other one was removed when we excavated. Um, I'm happy to hear any sort of explanation. Um, and the other one that we excavated was a, um, a young woman bundled up as if she had been wrapped in her hammock and buried, and then directly on top of her is an adult male lying straight out. Mm -hmm. um, so another really unusual, and the radiocarbon dates, although you know, they're not specific to a one individual date, from the two individuals were identical, mm -hmm. which is really yeah. unheard of. Yeah. So um, it appears that they were buried at the same time, um, both from the, the way they were buried and from the dates that we obtained. Um, we've also been working, um, as I said, underwater. Um, if you didn't recognize it, the photo of the pot at the beginning was, uh, was taken underwater. Mm. And then this is work that was done in Eleuthera recently on a burial in, um, um, in a cave on Eleuthera. And you can see the, the long bones and other mm. bones here. I want to say um, that, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking a bit cavalierly about human remains, but we do not um, excavate human remains lightly. Mm -hmm. um, we try and treat them with the same respect we would want our ancestors treated with. Mm -hmm. And um, they're housed right now in a, um, in a special location at the Antiquities um, Monuments and Museums Corporation in, um, in Nassau. And our hope, and I think Mike shares it with me, is that we will find um, a secure cave um, and return all the human remains to, um, to that location so that we can show um, proper respect um, for the human remains. And the individuals that I've showed you today are, um, are from burials that were being disturbed or um, uh, likely to be destroyed. So, um, How did you find out about the Long Island sand burials? Um, a couple of, uh, of locals were walking down the beach after Hurricane Joaquin, mm -hmm. and they found two human skulls on the beach and contacted Antiquities. Thank God they did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, the, the most important thing uh, is the, the only way to, uh, to preserve this knowledge is for people to step forward like this wonderful donation and, uh, and provide us with information about what's being found and where it's being found. Um, in most cases, we try and develop local museums and not move things off to, uh, um, you know, we don't just take everything back to the Smithsonian anymore. And uh, I've worked throughout the Caribbean and all the islands I've worked on, I've worked with them to develop their own museums and repositories. And um, um, so in, at the Florida Museum of Natural History, we have absolutely no artifacts from the Bahamas or Turks and Caicos, even though I've been working here 40 years. I have yes. a question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> These people moved into these islands from South and Central America. Mm -hmm. uh, originally. Where did they come from originally? It, I, I was taught in North America that the Indians came mm -hmm. across uh, 
from the bearing straight from yeah, yeah yes. and down. Uh, so what do you think? Th that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Right now. <laughs> Actually, we probably need to, to take inflation into account. That's a million dollar question. Right now. I believe that they found remains in South America that are even older than anything that could have come across the Bering Strait. Yeah. Exactly. Where from? <laughs> so one of the um, one of the new um, theories that's getting a lot of credence um, is that they actually came down the coast in boats so that the original people to come to the Americas came across the Aleutian Island Strait and, and Bering Sea in boats mm -hmm. and not walking through mm -hmm. um, because the, um, the ice-free corridor that they've talked about for years wasn't open um, in time for some of the early sites and there's actually a, a new site in Idaho of all places, mm. which is very early and well before the um, the ice free quarter would have opened. So um, yeah, it's and and people move at lightning speed. I mean, it took very little time for people to get from all the way from you know Alaska, northern can northwestern Canada, all the way down to the end of South America. Mm. So. Moving from sort of big fat islands, um, and Turks and Caicos look like big fat islands, although as most of uh, many of you know, the south side of these islands is often very shallow salina, which nobody could settle on, um, to a relatively narrow island like Long Island, we began to look at people using both sides of the island. Now, some of the early archaeologists who worked here said that you couldn't live on the Atlantic coast because it was too rough and too windy, and you couldn't land your canoes. But what we've been finding on Long Island is we have evidence for Lucayans along the entire Atlantic coast. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the excavations that we did um, on the Atlantic coast, where we, uh, this is where the um, burials actually were, and um, we were excavating, um, we were looking to try and, um, and understand who the what the uh, the cultural materials of burials were associated with because there was nothing with the burials themselves it was just the bones um, and so we found several sites again along this coast um, and one of the uh, the really remarkable things we found is that they were cooking in earth ovens and so one of the things that we expect is when a new technology comes along everybody's going to switch to that so once you have clay pots why would you use an earth oven but many of you have been to pig roasts, which is essentially the same <laughs> as an earth oven. Yeah. And um, there are probably very good reasons for that. So this is one of our earth ovens. It's kind of hard to see with the light the way it is. But basically, you, uh, you start a fire and um, build up the coals. You put rocks on top of that. Then you put some plant material to protect it. The food, more plant material, and then you cap it with earth. And you allow the food to bake for a certain amount of time. And um, Andy Siopolo, who's been working with my former, uh, my PhD student, Pete Zanelli, Pete has his PhD now, of course, um, here on Providencialis. Andy does um, what's called starch grain analysis. And so you can identify plants because they will actually leave a starch residue on certain objects. And so he looked at um, um, a limestone, a uh, sharp piece of limestone that would have been used in a board to grate um, plants and um, also some um, clamshell tools. And he identified <coughs> corn, manioc, which we expect is the staple, and um, a plant called zamia, or kunti, sometimes called cardboard bush in, in the islands. Um, zamia is fascinating because, like the saba, it's toxic, and it needs to be processed in a particular way to remove the toxins. And the Spanish talk about how the um, the archaic practice of peeling, grating, and then squeezing, and then they would make a ball out of the, um, the zamia flower, and they would let it sit until it was so full of um, weevils that um, they, they thought the toxin was out, and then they'd make the bread weevil and all. <laughs> a little bit of extra protein. Yeah. I'm going to... I'm trying to get Mike to grow some zamia so we can do that during one of my next visits. 
Hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll all join us for that. So this is the, you've all seen these Kodakia clams, I suspect. Um, these were being used as scrapers um, to actually cake the corn kernels off of the husk. Um, we now think that, uh, that maize was much more important in these islands than anybody expected. Everybody talks about them making cassava bread and growing cassava. But um, when we've done, uh, my colleagues have done starch grain analysis elsewhere, they're not finding much evidence for cassava. So what's going on? And I think there's two possibilities. One, because the caribs are coming from the tropical forest area, they may have introduced cassava into the Greater Antilles and then the Bahamas. So we're talking with about a relatively late introduction. The other thing is that the Spanish didn't have flour to make their hardtack that they needed for further voyages of exploration. But they found that cassava bread worked just as well. And so one of the problems that we have to overcome with the Spanish documents is they were recording things that were of interest to them yeah, yeah. and not yeah. providing us with general information about, uh, about cultural practices. So here's just a, a brief show of Long Island and all of the new stuff that we've been finding. The burials were down here. And I'm going to talk about a site, uh, the WIM site, which is located up here between 27 and 3, because we're, we're seeing evidence of Lucayan life ways that we didn't see before. And as you can see, Long Island is at the, um, only about 4 kilometers across. So it's, and as you know, the elevations here are, are virtually nothing. Um, you can comfortably walk across the island in about an hour. So using East Coast and West Coast, it, it makes absolutely no difference. And on this side, you have really extensive reefs. And on this side, you have the very shallow flats, seagrass environment. So they're very different environments. And, and we're looking at people exploiting both environments instead of just focusing on one. And again, this is a, a way we're breaking down this notion of villages, that it's not just people living in large villages, that there are places where they're living, but there are also areas where they're going to collect resources and other things. And you, someone today will have a house somewhere in town, perhaps, and they'll also have a boat in a different location. And so the same sort of thing we're seeing um, in all of these places. That, uh, and the other thing is that the Lucayans were everywhere. I mean, you almost can't go to, um, to a place in the Bahamas, and probably Turks and Caicos, although we need more survey work done here, without finding um, without finding something archaeological. The other really amazing thing is that these coastal ponds today were actually open, um, people might call them estuaries, but estuary needs a freshwater input. You know there's no rivers here, so um, Tidal Creek is the name that we typically use. And we're finding archaeological sites all along the edges and out on this side of these tidal creeks. So. Maybe on a bad day you can't land your boat or you can't take your boat out on the Atlantic, but you can always pop into one of these tidal creeks. And these tidal creeks will attract things like sea turtles and other marine resources, fishes. And so you have an area where you can exploit the Atlantic coast and still have a protected area. And Long Island, at least, the, this sort of separation occurs everywhere. The other thing that we're finding is that the sites are all located right along the edge of the dune. Oh. So they're not settling back on the main part of the island. Um, again, an argument against um, large villages. This is a clamshell midden from one of our Atlantic coast sites in Long Island. And just thousands of these Kodakia clams. Now, traditionally, we talk about our uh, Lucayan sites based on the discovery of palmetto ware. And so one of the, the keys was if it didn't have palmetto ware, it wasn't an archaeological site. This is clearly an archaeological site. We have found, and we've done some fairly substantial excavations, we found three pieces of palmetto ware at this site, none of which is larger than the nail of your thumb. So clearly, again, this notion that when pottery comes in, it becomes so important, everybody switches over to pepper pot and cooking in pots. But we're seeing they're using a variety of other techniques. And we're now putting together an argument that they were actually doing something called stone boiling, in which you heat rocks in the fire, you put them in an impermeable container, 
and it heats the water not quite to boiling, but almost to boiling. So earth ovens, stone boiling, um, barbecue, and clay pots. So it's a much more complicated cuisine. And I don't know why we would expect anything different, because we do the same thing. We steam foods, we boil foods, we parch foods, we, um, what else do we do? We barbecue, um, we fry. Um, there's all different ways to process foods, and some taste better when they're processed in different ways. And we're seeing that the Lucayans had this, um, this variety of techniques available to them. What did I skip over? Oh, one of the other things that um, we've been able to show People have said that tropical mollusks, the temperature doesn't change enough for them to, um, to show seasonal growth patterns. So we've been looking at Kodakia clams as a way to show what season of the year people were in a particular location. And we have found a nice curve mm -hmm. in the growth sequence that is related to temperature. So we're following up on this. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to tell what season of the year at least, or maybe even what month. Mm -hmm. um, these clams are being collected, which will again give us an idea of people's mobility and ability to move between different locations and maybe why they were in different locations. Now, I keep talking about exploding the village, and um, here is again is another example. The archaeological sites, the Lucayan sites that we're seeing, are out on these little strips of land right along the beach. I would say 80% of the time, there's a mangrove swamp behind them. They're not settled on the main island like... The insects would be terrible if you settle over there. Yes, every small key, right, Agile? Every small key has a site on it. They're, yeah. yeah. And another reason to be on the Atlantic exactly. side, because if you're over there with a the breeze... They eat you alive. Yep. Yeah. So, um, yes, so the modern community is living on the main island, but the Lucayans are living out here and there really isn't room to make those giant villages that you see in South America. And again, this is a good example. I mean, that's not a long way to get to the other shore. But we have a really serious problem, and we have the same problem today, and that is, um, is coastal erosion. And it's going to get even worse as sea levels come up. Mm -hmm. So one of the real problems that we have on Long Island is we know a lot of archaeological sites, and we have dense scatters of, um, of rock, and there's pottery in here, and shells and, um, and other things, but <coughs> this site, and many like it, it's just a scatter on the surface. It's been completely deflated. So as the soil erodes, um, the heavier objects stay in place, but there's nothing subsurface. So we have not, um, in most cases, been able to look at a long sequence of change in Lucayan practices, which is why the site LN8 is so important. Um, this, I forget, that's a scale, and I can't remember what the scale is now. Um, but this is the WIM site. It's located on someone's property, and we're actually excavating underneath their house. <laughs> um, so people have been building houses in this location for over a thousand years, the same spot. So it must be a really good spot. Um, and we've also found that they were dumping their garbage back here along the um, along the Salina. One of the things we think the re one of the reasons we think the site has survived is because there's this channel inlet. They've augmented it, but it was there. Um, it's always been there. And so when you get these big storm surges, a lot of it gets pushed out behind the site instead of just coming right over. But enough of the storm surge happens that we're able to actually see a sequence of um, occupations in this one location. And I'll show you another picture later, but these red lines are associated with three different living surfaces. You can see the dark and then the overburden from a, a storm wash, the same down here and up here on top. And so we have radiocarbon dated these, and these date to about 1100, this one's about 1100 AD, this one's about 1300 AD, and this one is in the 1400s. <coughs> so here we have the chance to look at how Lucayans lived and changed over a, um, a long period of time. There's no other site like this anywhere in the Bahamas, or, or Turks and Caicos. So, um, but you know of, yeah. That we know of yet. Yes, we didn't know of this one until. And the really wonderful thing about this site is because of the different strata, we're able to pick up things like this house post. So we know that there were houses there. And in fact, 
the different living surfaces, we can see house posts associated with each of them. Mm -hmm. So they'll start below a particular one, or this one cuts through several. Um, mm -hmm. Very deep, very distinct, quite wide. Um, large posts that were used to construct houses, and we're just beginning to uh, um, try and get a picture of what they look like. We haven't been able to excavate anywhere near enough to, um, to get a full picture of what a house is. I have suggested that they, um, they remove their current house and we can bring in a backhoe and <laughs> strip everything out and take a better look for features, but the landowners have not agreed to that. <laughs> I guess we should be glad that they let us work there yeah. at all under their house. And then we're getting some sort of some intimate artifacts as well and, and, and getting to know the Lucayans better, um, looking carefully. They made shell beads. One of the most important sites ever, in my mind, ever found since I found it huh? is, um, was under the Radio Turks and Caicos Towers on Grand Turk, just north of the governor's house. It's a shell bead making workshop. People were coming from um, Haiti or Dominican Republic. They were living there for um, probably seasonally. They were collecting something called the red jewel box. I don't know if you're familiar with the jewel box shell. It's one of the few that maintains its, um, its color forever. Um, those of you familiar with conk know that after a few years it's bleached white, it loses its pretty color. The jewel box shell, we have beads from that site that are 800 years old that are scarlet red. Um, and the Lucayans love making beads. Every archaeological site I've excavated, we have evidence that they were making beads. So um, probably as part of the exchange network. But this is a doll that's made out of Parides coral. It's about this big. Um, you can see the two eyes that have been carved in it. There's two eyes carved in the opposite side as well. There's a little bit of a mouth. Um, I like to think of this as a child's toy, perhaps, um, or a talisman. And yes, I know. <laughs> you can snicker in the back. <laughs> we all did too. When I first showed it to people, they were like, oh, no, yeah. That's uh, almost small, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't as big as we are. Um, uh, and we found a, a second one during this year's excavations in December. It's not exactly the same as this, but it's clearly um, a piece of parietes or finger coral. I shouldn't have said finger coral, right? Now I'm really getting in trouble. We're, uh, we're getting um, a much better picture of what they were eating. This is um, actually from an excavation on Crooked Island. It was just loaded with bone. The Palmetto Junction site that Dr. Sinelli's working at um, also has just a remarkable amount of bone. Um, this little animal here is a hutia. They are known to have, have lived in the Bahamas before people arrived. But what we're finding is that they're only in abundance in um, in a few locations, that uh, they're not, it's not like every site has a lot of hutia bones in it. Um, so one of the things that uh, my colleague um, uh, Michelle Lefebvre has looked at is um, the issue of hutias being managed and raised and kept in captivity. And um, she published a study last year that uh, looking at the, um, the stable isotopes in the bones suggests that they were actually eating corn which would indicate a strong connection with, with human beings. So I like the idea of this little rodent with his hands up eating gnawing on it. I've actually up. been bitten by a hutia. Have you really? You're probably the only one. <laughs> we were releasing him in the park in the exhumers. Oh, you were part of that project. Yeah, and he didn't want to come out of the cage. So I had gloves on. I had big gloves on. Um, fish, of course, extremely important. and. Um, and land crabs. We see lots and lots of land crabs being eaten. Um, this was actually crab and bait that we had at Rowdy Boys on Long Island. And <laughs> when I fed that to my crew as a delicacy one light, night, they almost uh, mutinied. Um, I don't know what their problem was. They didn't mutiny. And man's um, closest companion, dogs. Mm -hmm. To date, we only have um, the bones of dogs from four archaeological sites in all of the Lucayan Islands. Mm -hmm. um, two of them, Turks and Caicos. One mm -hmm. at, uh, 
Uh, and, and in fact, both from um, okay. both from Middle Kitchens, okay. I believe. Mm -hmm. Podcast. The original podcast. The original podcast. Yeah. Actually, my colleagues who study um, dogs say that they were um, hairless, um, like the Mexican hairless dog. Um, and these are dog's teeth that have holes drilled in to be worn as a pendant from this site we were working at in Long Island. So um, if any of you have pot cakes, I understand that they now have DNA tests for dogs. And so um, if you'll get some, uh, some pot cake DNA tests done, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can trace their ancestry. Maybe even all the way back to the Lucayans, because um, the folks who own the property say that uh, their uh, um, grandmother had a hairless dog oh. in Long Island. Wow. So, yeah. Oh. So pot cakes might actually be Lucayan. <laughs> <laughs> Descendants of those. Anyway. Um, can't possibly cover everything, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I want to say thanks to our research team. If you want more information, um, my book with Corinne Hoffman, The Caribbean Before Columbus, talks about all of the islands, including the Bahamas. Um, it's available on Amazon for a reasonable price. Um, I don't get much of a royalty, so I'm not saying this to promote the book. Um, we have to get Mike to start carrying them here in, uh, in the museum gift shop. Yeah, um, I'll buy one. <laughs> But I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have. Earlier, on, I thought you said the Tainos. Is that how yes. you pronounce it? Is that what I see? How, is, how do you spell that? T A I N O. Okay. But I've never heard of it. I guess I And there's an accent on the I. So the story is that um, originally that the group that moved up was called the Island Arawaks because they were related to Arawakan speaking peoples in South America. The problem with using language is that the Arawak language family is larger than Indo-European, which includes English and Hindi. So, I mean, to call someone an Arawak or an Arawak speaker is not really very <laughs> yeah, yeah. specific. Um, and the, uh, the archaeologists working in, um, in Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and Cuba decided that they wanted a more native sounding name and Taino is translated as meaning noble or good, and so um, that was adopted. But essentially, you just replace one name with another name without gaining any real um, additional knowledge about who these people were. Well, I'm sure that the common myth I've heard or story is that the Lucayans were peaceful, and then they were pursued up the chain of islands by the Caribs, who were warlike and supposedly cannibals. Is there any, any uh, what would you comment about that? That's a, a huge oversimplification of the yeah. situation because there's, um, there's been, um, there's one very excellent study done by a, a German anthropologist in the 19, uh, actually it's published in 1917, in which he says that when the Arawaks expanded, they used exactly the same practices as the Caribs. That okay. if they could infiltrate a community that was already existing, then they had peaceful relations. If they couldn't, they would conquer them. And so um, the, the notion that you have one group is peaceful and the other group is not is... It's um, PR. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> PR. And, and I would just add to that that once the Spanish crown said that it was okay to enslave people who refused to be Christianized and who eat human flesh, Every native person in the entire Caribbean region became a, a cannibal. A oh, cannibal. No, no they, they were defined as. Yeah. Uh, they, they didn't even bother to try and Christianize them. Oh. So they just rounded them up and enslaved them. Yes. Are there any Are there any Lucayans still around? I don't know. Um, we're finding the, the the standard answer is that after 1520 they were all gone. But we're finding um, archaeological sites and getting radiocarbon dates that go up into the 1600s. So um, they probably were here much longer. There's no written records by the British that they encountered anyone here. But um, I have no reason to believe that uh, there's not still Lucayan DNA floating around in these islands. There's a very active group on Facebook that traces their ancestry. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember if they're Lucayan, they call themselves Lucayan. Taino. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so here and then I've been yeah. there. I, I wanted to ask you, do you think those um, 
The population of the Bahamas, well, and the Turks and Caicos mm -hmm. being part of the Bahamas, then, was more like trading post than long time um, living the, living here a long time. Maybe they were coming, like giant markets, and then going back, or? No, it looks like long-term settlement, and um, as I was showing with those different strata, we have people living in one location over and over again for a long period of time, and fairly substantial houses. So I don't think that it was just short-term. Yeah. And the, these islands have plenty of resources if you know how to um, how to get them. Yeah, they, they are also say that in, in um, Indian original mm -hmm. Indians. Um, they, in those islands, they would probably claim Taino. Um, only people in the Bahama chain in the Lucayan Islands would be Lucayans. Although we suspect that some of the Lucayans escaped to Cuba or to Hispaniola because those were their trading partners. And when the Spanish became too pesty, um, they moved. We know people from Haiti moved to Cuba um, when the Spanish expanded through, uh, through uh, Hispaniola. So. Let me go to the back. You've been waiting yeah, patiently. My question is, is that I know that in the island of Dominica they had a cargo reserve. Uh -huh. that still exists. So I was wondering if you had used that as a reference point in well, for the archaeological findings in the Caribbean, if they use that cargo reserve in Dominica as a reference point to all the different things that you're finding. Yes, my colleague, um, Corrine Hoffman, my, my co-author on the book, has been doing a lot of work. Um, I've done a, a couple of projects in Dominica with a colleague. Um, and. Um, the, um, the French provide very detailed accounts of the people who were living there. Um, we just published, we just came to this conclusion on a separate care of migration, but that's certainly a literature that we need to go to to, um, to try and um, sort of make sense of some of the stuff that was going on here in the Bahamas as well. So yes, that's a good point. I yes, come, I, come back. I gotta go to the back, they've been waiting patiently. Um, the best way to know anyone's story is to hear from them directly. I think um, Puerto Rico and Hispaniola are blessed with historical accounts that we can read of, you know, the French and the Spanish actually trying to translate and then saying these who these people are in their own words. So are there any historical, like, first person Lucayan characters at all? No, wow. no, unfortunately there aren't. Sad. It is sad, yes. So um, we're trying to be their voice. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I, I'm, I'm back to the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> He's a seaman. I, I, uh, have you found any canoes? There is a small canoe from um, Stargate um, Blue Hole on um, Andros. Andros. Okay. And, but it's what? Uh, it's, it's long, six feet. but it's very, very skinny, so it looks like it was just a ceremonial one-person canoe that was associated with a burial. Mm -hmm. Now, the, oh, there's something else we could do in, in, in our um, Lucayan food ways. I've decided in my retirement, I'm, I'm headed out the door, I'm going to write a Lucayan cookbook, so um, <laughs> maybe I'll come and, and have you guys help me with the experiments. Um, those little canoes, the ceremonial canoes, one of the things they do in South America is make manioc beer. And um, they use those kind of wooden canoes to do it. And what you do is, um, what you have to do is you peel the cassava and then you have to chew it and then spit it into the canoe. And then it is allowed to ferment for a certain amount of time. So if there's any volunteers, if you want to sign up for um, beer production, for beer production we'll, uh, um, it'll be the uh, Turks and Caicos have its own beer now? Yep. Yeah. Turks Head. Yeah. Turks Head. Okay, well, we'll have to come up with Provo Head beer or something. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be foolish to think that there isn't still Arawak or uh, Taino DNA in people. Mm -hmm. We had a, a very close friend here from Belize who very proudly referred to herself as, I can't remember, Lucayan or she had history that had been passed down from her family. She's since moved back to Belize. Uh, so they're, but the problem was that they were so oppressed and their culture was destroyed that they had to hide mm. their ancestry. Mm. So, but there's still, there's still people for sure that have uh, 
an ancestry that goes back. To the, yeah. Not many, probably. And I can, I can answer that a little further. So as Bill mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of a, a DNA study with about um, 30 remains from throughout the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't have any from the Turks and Caicos yet. Mm -hmm. But um, with the sort of burgeoning growth of DNA for people doing personal DNA, so in the Bahamas, I've always heard these people say, oh, uh, my descendants are Lucayans. And I was just like, yeah, 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 right. Just, yeah, yeah. right. But um, a few people have shared with me their personal DNAs. Mm -hmm. And there was a DNA study done from Preacher's Cave in the Bahamas with the Lucayans government. <coughs> it was just one result. This um, DNA result tied back to the Taino in the Puerto skeleton. Rico. Yeah. yeah, this skeletal result tied back into the Taino in Puerto Rico. But now that that's been published, people who are doing their DNAs today, if they have any trace of um, Caribbean native yeah, DNA, yeah. it pulls them back to that Lucayan DNA. Mm. Now, it's not enough to say, yes, they are a Lucayan descendant, but it shows that they have some sort of indigenous blood. Mm -hmm. So when we publish these 30 results, um, then it'll be just further data to tie back into it. So we'll have a better answer probably in a few months. Mm -hmm. um, but who knows, it's, um, the DNA has to su have survived somewhere. Oh, yeah. But well, could you comment, would you have any idea, the, the people on, on the Andros that were considered, quote, Indians. The Seminoles, they're, oh, they're they descendants of Seminoles, so yes. They were uh, there was a migration of Seminole, okay. or actually black Seminoles, during the Seminole Indian Wars from Florida into the Bahamas. And, and what century about would that be? The 1800s. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh. And they formed a community, a community okay. um, red base where yeah. Yeah. you look at the people and you can see the Indian mm -hmm. descent in them. So to get back to canoes real quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you've seen the paddle in um, yeah. Grand Turk and there's only one other like it. It's from Moores Island um, oh. in, um, off of Abaco. So again, Turks and Caicos, unique. Um, yeah. But we're... Um, we're finding now there are a lot of peat deposits on um, a lot of islands in places where we didn't expect to find them. Abaco, we worked at uh, two sites that are um, essentially peat deposits. So the potential for something like that to have been preserved is really good. We just haven't excavated enough area. Yeah, I wanted to take that thing a little bit further because mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't know if you have, you have paddled around a bit. Uh, I have. Yeah. So if you, you, when, the, when the wind is behind you, don't you feel like you could could do this and you sail, right? Why don't they sail? Why don't they go across the o ocean with the wind? Why don't they sail? With them? So they had cotton. Yeah. Um, when I was in um, Honduras, we saw a guy with a, um, a bush in the front of his boat. <laughs> and we asked what the bush was there for, and it says, well, the wind picks, catches the leaves and pushes it along. So the, the idea is not that difficult, and that was, seemed like a very novel um, um, again, we're stuck with the European descriptions, and there's no descriptions of sails, right. so everybody says, well, they didn't have sails. But we're finding out a lot about these people that nobody ever yeah, said anything exactly. about or exactly. said the opposite of. So, I mean, maniac, for example, like maniac's the staple, all they do is maniac. It's all cassava bread, and yet corn, and corn was like, eh, corn isn't very important. Because the cornbread rotted after a day or two, so they didn't, Spanish didn't want anything to do with that stuff. So yeah, uh, um, I think sales are a real possibility. It's something I haven't closed my mind to. I, I have a parallel to that in, in my old country, Norway, because the Vikings uh, were known to have sails on their Viking ships, but they had Viking ships, or ships like the Viking ships, in the Iron Age, mm -hmm. up to 600, and, and, and they had no sail. Mm. And, and I thought that was very stupid. <laughs> it does seem very stupid, yes. If you and when they got sales, they, they, they conquered Europe, right? That's <laughs> all it takes. <laughs> yes, in the back. We've always been taught that um, the Lucayans were peaceful people as opposed to the Caribs who were more like warlike or... Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in you know, like new discoveries and new sites. Um, how that view is continuing to evolve in terms of was this, were these islands a refuge for even people to escape war and other islands and come here and 
the same way you talked about um, cooking, just how, you know, with an abundance of resources, how cooking culture over a period of years gets more complex. Mm -hmm. So in a peaceful society, did they have fun? Did they have games? Oh, yeah. and, you know, like, how, how, what was being in a peaceful society like for them? Mm -hmm. So, as much as you know. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to, I want to go back to the war part of it, because, you know, when you talk about war, we tend to put it in our own frame of reference. And we learned with Vietnam that our frame of reference was wrong. Um, that people would practice things like guerrilla warfare. Um, and tribal societies are often like that. And you could have a Carib community living next to an Arawak community, and they could swear that they were enemies. And yet, they're exchanging spouses, they're exchanging goods, um, and as long as things remain sort of status quo, you're, you're fine living next to them as neighbors. But if something goes wrong, someone gets injured, someone gets killed by accident, or even on purpose, or some other transgression, then all of a sudden you're enemies again. Um, so we have a, an overly simplistic notion of, of warfare. And, you know, Part of it comes from Columbus, and he says, well, you know, they didn't have any weapons. Well, they didn't have any swords or iron weapons or, or guns, but if you read the account of him coming ashore in Guanahani carefully, he was met by 30 young men carrying spears. Now, these were people there to defend their village if the, if the Europeans behaved badly. I mean, this is not a, necessarily a peaceful response to somebody new arriving on an island. Um, so, um, I think peaceful is as peaceful as we, um, as we need to be and are willing to be. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there were games and other things. One of the, the articles that I've done recently was identifying children in an archaeological, in archaeological context. That's why the, the, um, the doll was so exciting to me, because um, I think it was, really was a child's toy, um, despite its shape and, um, um, but, um, I've talked to colleagues who, who study children today in, um, in traditional societies, and um, it sounds very much like what it, it was probably like here, where you know the parents may be down on the beach, and the kids just go far enough away that the parents can't see them, but that they can, they can look around the corner and say, oh good, mom and dad are still there. Yeah. Um, they play games like, um, um, the way our children emulate adult things. They play doctor, uh, or they may call it shaman, but they play doctor. Um, they pretend or actually try to fish and use um, other tools that people do. Young, um, young children will often be taken care of by their slightly older siblings. Um, we unfortunately don't know enough. I'm thinking we, we're finding a lot of that coral, and it's kind of funny little pieces, and it's broken up. And I'm trying to come up with what game they were playing with it, because I think it was actually used for a game. Um, but I, I haven't, haven't wrapped my head around that one yet. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, I mean, would you describe us as peaceful? Yeah. In, in Turks. Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, but no. <laughs> but what if, what if uh, Dominican Republic decided that they wanted to uh, to take, what if Canada decided they wanted to claim the first game? <laughs> they tried. <laughs> I, I remember. Uh, yeah. Wait a second. There was a hand back here? Yes. Um, I think I remember reading somewhere that there was evidence of a game with a ball. A ball court. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Keys, yeah. But maybe that was more for the adults to play, even? Okay, so that's one of, that's a, something that's gotten blown out of proportion. Um, it's actually right there on the wall. I know. <laughs> Uh, the Spanish talk about a game, and they talk about it as using to sort of divine the future or ask, um, you know, which team wins, decides which way they're going to go. Um, there are um, what we now call stone-lined courts um, all over the Caribbean, and they're different shapes, different sizes, and probably very different functions. Um, so. Um, the ball game may not have been as big a deal as archaeologists have made it out to be. And we make it a big deal because it suggests contact with Mesoamerica and the, the Maya ball game, but the, the courts 
in the Caribbean look nothing like the quartz in the Maya area. So um, it's, um, yeah, they're probably um, clearly from the descriptions they had rubber balls. So um, they probably played a variety of games with rubber balls as well. Um, but the, the ball game itself may have been, um, uh, may not have been wide, as widespread as people have, um, have reported in the past. Yes, ma'am. Um, I lived and grew up in North Vegas. And on the southern end of the island, Red Money, the settlement, mm -hmm. um, they, um, as a child growing up there, they had a, like a scaffold, we call them in our and it was like maybe 200 feet long by maybe 100 feet. And we was told that maybe that's where the slaves used to socialize, like had parties. And it was built up with huge, huge stones. Mm. But it was leveled, and it could hold a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And we were told that maybe that's where they socialized. They mm -hmm. had parties over there. That's very interesting. I don't I know about that. Do you think that that structure might have been there for before Africans or anything came? I or, don't know. Okay. Those, those stones were there. Had to be done by the slaves, large stones. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was like evenly. 200 feet long, maybe wow. 100 mm. feet wide. Wow. Wow. It's still there, I suspect. Maybe a portion. A portion. Mm -hmm. be interesting wow. to see that. Yes? You brought up cotton earlier. Mm -hmm. How did the Lucayans use cotton, if not for sales? So we, my student, Yos Morsink, who worked at, um, at MC6, um, we think that part of that was actually a cotton field. And Columbus was incredibly impressed with cotton when he came through um, the Lucayan Islands. Um, and then when he got to Cuba as well. In fact, he talked about cotton raining down from the sky. So silk cotton trees, That's which true. you don't see so much anymore because they got cut down by the loyalists. But they're still around, and they were yes. probably here as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, the uh, Lucayans would give him what? What he reports is 16 pound balls of cotton, cotton hmm. thread. Thread? Yeah. Hmm. So, so they spun it somehow. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any, anything that survived. Um, the Spanish talk about women wearing a short skirt to, um, to cover themselves. Um, but it would not surprise me if there was um, um, a whole wide range of uses that we haven't even started to consider. And cotton grows so well on these islands, unless you try and overproduce and, and which you destroy the environment, which mm -hmm. is essentially what the loyalists did. Um, but it, it, was, um, it was a very important crop for them. In fact, I'm talking to Mike. We want to do an article on cotton for Times of the Islands. So. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, is it yeah. Possible that the Lucayans were aware of the Europeans before they turned up, or pretending that it floated across the Atlantic okay. Ocean, like like you might expect today, coming across the currents. It wouldn't surprise me. I've got glass fishing floats um, in my collection from beaches. I have a um, an African statue that I picked up on a beach in the Bahamas. Um, I assumed it was from Haiti, but working in Haiti, I didn't see anything that looked like it, and somebody told me it looked more. Uh, Dahomey, but I haven't never followed up on that, so that's possibly of African origin. Um, Columbus reported a shipwreck off of Guadeloupe that looked European to him. So, um, well, some of them never came back. Must, <laughs> <laughs> must have been here. The uh, relative to that, I expect a lot of people have seen what they call sea hearts or sea beans. Uh, these are large seeds you'll find here. Mm -hmm. Those were floated across the Atlantic and to the Azores and places. And Columbus and people had talked to every seaman they'd ever seen, have you ever seen these seeds growing anywhere? And nobody said yes. That was one of the things that made Columbus say, there's something <coughs> out there. It's where these seeds are coming mm -hmm. from that no, no person in Europe has ever seen this seed on a, on a vine. Mm -hmm. So I'm certain that the, the obverse happened, mm -hmm. that things would show up here that the, the air I should say, has anybody ever seen something like this before? So I'm sure, I'm sure it did happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Come back again, please. <laughs> I'm like a bad penny. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bill, for your wonderful talk, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it was good to see so many people out here today. Uh, I think we all learned quite a bit. Oh, um, yeah. Even I learned a few things, Bill, that you haven't yeah, discussed with me. My, my, my. <laughs> um, as you can tell, we're good friends. So oh, yeah. My wife says we're um, brothers at different ages who have been separated from my birth because we're so similar until it's a little scary. But um, as I said at the beginning, we are a nonprofit, so and we do do a lot of research in the islands. I showed you the vessel that we just recovered. And we want to do more things like this, and donations and memberships and so forth always help. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, Kan Yan's there in the back, and she can help you out. And I think she wants to say something also. No, I was just saying the picture of the vessel. I don't, some people can read. So oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, go back to the beginning. <laughs> Thank you, big blue. <laughs> so that's so, uh, the photo of the vessel that we recovered here in the Caicos Islands. Um, and hopefully one day soon you'll see it on display in the National Museum yes. shortly over there. But definitely once it's conserved we will develop a display case in here and Kim and Mark are working on a nice little video that's going to talk more about the discovery, the, a little bit of background on the Lucayans, um, and even what the vessel is. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and there's a question from Mark. Is that is that in a cave? Yes, it's on, it's on the water of the cave, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the whatever in a cave, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, actually, we actually found it many years ago, and I'm grateful it's still there. Wow. Oh, no, it's not. No, 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 no. <laughs> Grateful it still exists. But, it's not. but and actually, that brings up a very good point. And Bill talked about this a little bit in his presentation. It's so important that when things like this are found, that you just don't pick it up yeah. and take it away and then put it in your house. Um, context. Context is everything for us. And but also, you know, um, we, we, uh, we asked Lindsay, to, uh, Dr. Block, to join us specifically because of her specialty. And if, if you take something like that, a clay pot, out of uh, saltwater environment after it's been in there for mm. you know six eight eight hundred thousand years, the salts are going to just er completely erode the vessel. So maybe if if somebody had taken it out and put it in their house, they would have had it for a year or two. But after a short period of time, so um, she's helped develop a conservation plan um, that hopefully after several, it's going to take several months at least. Um, it will be uh, stable enough to be dried and then put on display. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's two halves that fit together? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Almost definitely. Wow. And we hope to actually, when it's finished conserved, to put it back together so that people can see exactly what it looked mm -hmm. like. And mm -hmm. uh, Lindsay brought the material that we will use to put it back together, hopefully. I'm going to knock on wood there. <laughs> Do you think there might be more or something wide? Well, you never know. Um, yeah. That's why we're constantly looking, studying, surveying. If this is there, it's possible that there's something else somewhere else. We know, um, Bill kind of alluded to this, that we know of a burial here in Provo in a blue hole. And I'm hoping to raise funds this year for us to study that because we've, we don't have any burials from the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, that could reveal so much to us. Would it be DNA, when yeah. the DNA studies that I'm doing now, or the facial profiling? Are they the same people as the people we find in the Bahamas? Mm -hmm. And we with, with, so, but with development, this sinkhole is threatened. Um, mm -hmm. It could collapse at any time as, as mm -hmm. these housing mm -hmm. developments spread out across. It's not that far from the airport. So. Mm -hmm. but, but also, in caves, they're so full of silt. There's <coughs> yeah. Plenty of stuff just underneath and buried, you wouldn't know it was there. And we're constantly looking when we're in caves and 
an underwater seeing what we can find. Okay. I was hoping to find pirate's treasure, but you know, <laughs> found this <laughs> last part. And well, you wouldn't tell us if you found it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everyone patronized Big Blue. Right. <laughs> I agree. So I saw another question. Yeah, yeah. Did you say you're privy to knowing that there actually is a burial? Yeah. Yeah. And how or how do you know that? <laughs> because he saw it. <laughs> oh. Back in the 80s, I saw it. You did? And someone like has been bump? in there recently and has confirmed that it's still there. No way. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, I just think it's crazy. And, but I know from experience in the Bahamas especially mm -hmm. that people find these things and then they just take them out. Yeah. And sometimes they report it and bring it to you and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. um, while I worked for the Bahamas government, we had... Uh, the same cave that Bill talked about in Eleuthera, mm. we had a skull turned over to us from U.S. Customs because somebody tried to take it out of the country. Mm. Wow. Um, and that's one of, that's the main reason why we recovered those burials, were because that cave was so easily accessible. People were just going there and taking the skulls. Look at all the stuff that people are taking off the reefs. All of those treasure hunters. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Pillage, pillage and silence. Yeah, they find yeah. handles and some of they put them on dry land and and then they rest and they disappear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one of the main importances of a museum, and especially the Turks and Caicos National Museum. Um, a lot of this stuff can be saved for the enjoyment of mm -hmm. the residents, the citizens, the visitors, and researchers, because now that we have a museum here, people can come visit us and look at our collections and study of it. And mm -hmm. it can actually be another form of tourism. Mm -hmm. And I think Kanya wants me to say something no, I was else. Just saying, um, Yes, Denise. Yeah, so Denise is the one who donated these wonderful ceramic vessels that are here, and she's promised to show us where they found it, which will be great because there aren't that many sites known of in Provo that I know about. And so just every little bit. Finding more every day. Yeah. And Agile, who we work with quite a bit, has been finding sites everywhere. Um, Every time, every other day, I get an email from Rachel. I found this on a key. Found this on a key. So, um, and once again, he leaves it, lets us know, and then it's there for study. But once again, I'd like to thank everybody for attendance, and we hope to see you soon at another event. We're going to have to try and find someone else to come in and talk, but mm -hmm. we will continue to try and have these as many times as we have visited researchers come to town. Thank you. Thank you.